Good morning. Today we will be talking about um, diabetes managed diagnosis and management. So our objectives today is to be able to diagnose type 2 diabetes, understand the concepts involved in management of type 2 diabetes, understand the mechanism of actions of various diabetes medications, to be able to select appropriate appropriate medications for individual diabetic patients with the goal not only to treat glucose, but to prevent complications. Understand the importance of diet and lifestyle modification in management of diabetes. To be familiar with different types of insulin and understand appropriate use of insulin in various settings. So before we start, who should we screen for diabetes? So testing for pre-diabetes and diabetes should be done in all patients over 45 years of age. Um, besides those, all those who are overweight and obese and have one of the following risk factors must be screened for diabetes. And this includes first degree relatives with uh, type 2 diabetes, patients with type 2 diabetes, history of hypertension or cardiovascular disease, history of uh, having hyperlipidemia, sedentary lifestyle, history of gestational diabetes, polycystic ovary syndrome, and presence of clinical features of insulin resistance like acanthosis nigricans. Now, how do we diagnose diabetes? There are several different ways for diagnosing diabetes. It can be diagnosed with the help of fasting plasma glucose. So if you're fasting plasma glucose of more than 126 is consistent with diabetes or a two hour plasma glucose of more than um, 200 after a 75 gram glucose load is also consistent with diabetes. Another way of checking is through hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is the test which, which, is, uh, which is like an average of uh, your glucose in three months time. And an A1C of uh, more than 6.5 or more is consistent with diabetes. And a random glucose of more than 200 um, is also consistent with diabetes. Now, pre-diabetes um, is a condition uh, which is uh, sort of in between normal and diabetic state. So pre-diabetes is when your glucose is not normal, but it's also not in diabetic range. And uh, again, pre-diabetes can be diagnosed with the help of fasting glucose. So a fasting glucose of 100 to 125 is consistent with pre-diabetes. A fasting glucose under 100 is considered normal. Similarly, if you have a two hour post 75 grams glucose tolerance, tolerance test between 140 to 190, it's considered, it is consistent with pre-diabetes. And a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4 is also consistent with pre-diabetes. So diabetes, as we know, is a chronic illness and a lot of factors are involved in the management of diabetes other than medications. Management of patients with diabetes includes intensive lifestyle modification involving medical nutrition therapy, weight reduction, physical activity. Then you have uh, pharmacotherapy, which includes all your medications, then psychosocial intervention, and surgical therapy in selected cases. There are two sets of guidelines that are used in the United States for management of diabetes, one by American Diabetes Association, and the other one is by American Association of Cl Clinical Endocrinologists. I will talk about uh, where each medication fits into the guideline when we discuss individual medications. But I wanted to point out some basic differences between the two guidelines. The ADA guidelines until recently mainly emphasized on urine oral using oral medications first, followed by injectables, and it's more cost-based. So cheaper medications are advised to be used first, followed by the more expensive medications. However, in 2019, these guidelines were revised and now ADA has more or less similar approach to ACE guidelines. The AC guidelines, as you can see, is uh, based more on disease progression and presence or absence of cardiovascular disease and other comorbidities. These guidelines start with lifestyle modification and uh, as the first line agent 
uh, is the same. Um, uh, the first line agent is the same for both guidelines, and that is metformin. However, the second line agent here is GLP, which is injectable medication. Both ADA and ACE recommend insulin treatment. Hemoglobin A1C um, at diagnosis is more than nine. So lifestyle modification with diet and exercise is the most important part in management of diabetes. Several large trials have demonstrated that diet, weight loss, and exercise can delay or prevent prediabetes or progression from prediabetes to diabetes. The DPP trial was a large study including 3,200 patients with prediabetes showed that patients assigned to intensive lifestyle modification, including diet and, and weight loss, had 58% reduction in development of diabetes compared to placebo. The Finnish diabetes prevention study was another study that was uh, conducted on prediabetics and that uh, involved 522 patients and found that weight loss, increased fiber intake and physical activity reduced the risk of de uh, developing diabetes by 58%. So diabetes education is one of the most important components of diabetes management. Patients with newly diagnosed diabetes should participate in a comprehensive diabetes self-management education program, which, which should include nutritional counseling, optimizing metabolic control, and preventing complications. Regardless of one's initial, uh, initial weight, proper nutrition and weight loss improves body's ability to regulate the blood glucose. Proper nutrition for type 2 diabetes is well-balanced, low-calorie, low-carb diet. Independent of weight loss, increased physical activity has shown to decrease insulin resistance. In clinical trials comparing diabetes education with usual care, there was a statistically significant reduction in A1C in patients receiving diabetes um, education intervention. Medical nutrition therapy is a process by which a diet plan is tailored for people with diabetes uh, based on their uh, medical lifestyle and personal factors. For patients with type 2 diabetes, overweight or obesity, major emphasis should be placed on weight reduction. For patients who are not trying to lose weight, the goal of medical nutrition therapy is weight maintenance and consistency in their day-to-day day -day caloric intake and carbohydrate intake. As I mentioned, um, exercise uh, is an independent factor that improves insulin resistance. Adults with diabetes are encouraged to perform 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five days a week, um, and uh, that should involve an aerobic activity such as uh, uh, walking or um, running or biking. Surgical therapy. Weight loss surgery in patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes results in a largest degree of sustained weight loss and improves blood glucose control. Weight loss surgery, such as bariatric surgery and lab band surgery, is an option to treat poorly controlled diabetes when other modalities have failed. So when should you start uh, treatment for diabetes? Often treatment is not initiated soon enough, resulting in poor glycemic control. For the most part, it is recommended to start metformin treatment along with lifestyle modification at the time of diagnosis or sometimes even in pre-diabetes stage if the patient is obese or if they have a lot of risk factors. As early institution of treatment, when hemoglobin A1C is not high, is associated with improved glycemic control and decreased long-term complications. A certain group of highly motivated patients um, can be treated, can be given a three-month trial of lifestyle modification, and that's a reasonable approach. So moving on to diabetes medications, this is a list of all the medications we currently have for diabetes. Until about two decades ago, we had only a handful of medications to treat diabetes in addition to insulin. In the last decade or so, many new classes of diabetic medications have emerged. The top six, six um, uh, classes, um, uh, six boxes, these top six boxes indicates the oral medications. Uh, and then you have your uh, non-insulin injectables and then insulin. Uh, 
So the first uh, box here is, so broadly you divide uh, your um, diabetes medications into the ones that increase insulin sensitivity, uh, increase insulin secretion, and then, then the group that increases insulin sensitivity or decreases insulin resistance. And then there's a third group that works independently of insulin. So the first group here is the insulin secretagogues which includes the sulfonylureas and the metaglinides. The second group is the insulin sensitizers, which work by increasing and decreasing insulin resistance. And this includes your uh, metformin and thiazolidiones. Um, then you have your glucose absorption inhibitors, which includes uh, uh, mainly acarbose. Um, you have glucose excretors, which uh, work by excreting uh, excess glucose in urine. And uh, those are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Then you have your incretin pathway uh, where uh, you have your GLP agonist and the DPP-4 inhibitors. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, some of the other medications are the, those that work indirectly via counter-regulatory hormone. And one of those medications is bromocryptin. Uh, and after the oral medications, then you have your injectable medications, which includes the GLP-1 agonist and the pramlinotide, and finally insulin. So amongst the oral medication, uh, the first one uh, that's most well known is metformin. It is one of the oldest and most widely used medications for diabetes worldwide. Um, and it is the initial suggested therapy for diabetes along with lifestyle modification. Uh, on uh, both ADA as well as ACE guidelines. The starting dose for metformin is usually 500 milligrams daily or BID as tolerated, and with titration to a max dose of uh, 2000. Now, how does metformin work? It works at different levels. It, um, in the gut, it decreases absorption of glucose. In the liver, metformin decreases gluconeogenesis. And in the tissues, it promotes increased glucose uptake and utilization. It also decreases glucose absorption. So some of the, what are some of the risks and benefits for metformin? So metformin is one of the cheapest diabetes medication with minimal side effects and most benefits. It has less glycemic efficacy out of all diabetic medications. Um, second, uh, it has uh, it is sort of weight neutral. So, and in some cases, when combined with uh, lifestyle modification, it has shown to actually promote some weight reduction. Um, it is a insulin sensitizer, and and it does not secrete uh, work by decrease by increasing insulin secretion, and therefore it has a very low risk for hypoglycemia, and it is cheap. Uh, as far as the risk is concerned, um, metformin really does not have a lot of side effects. Uh, the most common side effects are GI related and mainly includes nausea and diarrhea. Uh, diarrhea most common. Uh, nausea is mostly uh, people develop tolerance to it and it goes away in a couple of weeks. Some of the other side effects are lactic acidosis and uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. Lactic acidosis mainly occurs in people who have uh, liver problems and metformin uh, must be used cautiously in that situation. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiency uh, is common with metformin and uh, this can get confusing in people who have diabetic neuropathy since the symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency are similar to um, uh, diabetic neuropathy. And therefore it's recommended that levels of B12 uh, must be uh, checked periodically in patients with, who are taking metformin. And then uh, finally, renal function uh, needs to be monitored in patients with uh, type two uh, patients who are on metformin. So there's a general misconception about metformin causing liver damage. In patients with normal liver function, uh, um, normal renal function, metformin does not cause kidney damage. Uh, and because uh, it's important to understand this because uh, metformin has so many benefits, uh, one should know when to hold metformin or uh, discontinue metformin. Uh, 
So uh, there is recent data that supports uh, the safety of metformin. In 2016, FDA revised the labeling of metformin in persons with mild to moderate renal insufficiency. So until uh, this uh, happened, metformin was uh, supposed to be discontinued in patients over uh, GFR of 50. However, after this revised guidelines, FDA recommendation is to start metformin if GFR is uh, okay to start metformin if GFR is above 45 and continue metformin with periodic assessment, assessment of the risk if GFR is between 30 to 45. Uh, it is contraindicated in patients with a GFR of less than 30. It is recommended to uh, uh, check GFR at least annually in all patients taking metformin. And then discontinue, uh, G, discontinue metformin in patients who have a GFR between 30 to 60 um, and is associated with, uh, along with liver disease, alcoholism, and heart failure. Uh, metformin should also be held before um, having an iodinated uh, contrast imaging procedure. Uh, patients should be reevaluated in 48 hours and after the imaging procedure and restart metformin if the renal function is stable. So the next class of medication is thiazolidiones. This class was very popular in early 2000. However, several agents from this class have been taken off the market uh, due to side effects and especially fluid retention and heart failure. Uh, this class is not very popular now and is used in select group of patients with high insulin resistance uh, where fluid retention is not an issue. So how, does, how do thiazolidiones work? Um, they improve metabolic control in patients with type 2 diabetes through the improvement of insulin sensitivity. And they exerted anti-diabetic effects through the PPAR gamma, which is a nuclear receptor. The TZD-induced activation of PPAR gamma alters the transcription of several genes involved in glucose and lipid metabolism and energy balance. So TZDs mainly act at the tissue level where they increase fatty acid uptake, increase lipogenesis, and increase glucose uptake. Then your next class is the sulfonylureas, which is another big class of medication that is used worldwide and relatively uh, cheaper in cost. Sulfonylureas stimulate uh, work by stimulating release of insulin. They work by blocking the ATP-sensitive potassium channels in the beta cells, reducing potassium permeability. What are some of the risks and benefits of sulfonylureas? Benefit-wise, it's worldwide, used worldwide. It is very cheap, um, and it's easy to take. However, because it works by releasing insulin, uh, it has a very high risk of hypoglycemia. Some of the recent studies have also linked um, sulfonylureas with um, heart failure. And so uh, in current days, with, uh, with all the new medications that are out now, the use of sulfonylurea is uh, relatively uh, decreasing. One of the other class of medications that works uh, sort of in a similar fashion to sulfonylureas is the megalitinides, which includes the ripaglinide and metaglinide. These are relatively short acting medications and therefore they are mostly used with meals. They interact with the ATP sensitive potassium channels and increase insulin secretion from the beta cells of pancreas. And uh, they have a rapid onset of action and a shorter half-life. Uh, two of these medications are ripaglinide and metaglinide. Ripaglinide has a much shorter half-life. It sort of works like a short-acting insulin, so it has to be taken before meals. And it works very well in patients who um, kind of require some, kind of, some postprandial coverage, uh, meaning if the glucose is going, going up after meals, this is a good medication to use in these patients. Um, and the nitaglinide has a relatively a little bit longer half-life, and so um, it's taken uh, twice a day. Um, both should be used cautiously in uh, patients with hepatic and uh, renal impairment. Um, then is the glucose absorption inhibitors uh, and acarbose. Acarbose has been there for a long time. Um, but it's not very potent and is reserved for uh, those who cannot take other medications as it has uh, a lot of, uh, it's not very well tolerated and uh, has side effects involving diarrhea, constipation, and bloating. 
Colbicillam is a class, uh, it's actually a bile acid sequestrant, which is used as a cholesterol lowering medication, but it also has a blood glucose lowering effect. The mechanism of action is not clearly understood. Um, it does have a, a lot of side effects and is not uh, generally used. The next big class of medication is incretins. The incretins are a hot topic these days. Uh, so the incretics are insulinotropic hormones, which are secreted from a specialized um, neuroendocrine cells of the, in the small intestine in response to carbohydrate meals. Um, they enter the blood vessels as they rapidly inact as they enter the blood vessels. They're rapidly inactivated by the proteolytic enzyme dipeptidyl dipeptidase, uh, which is the DPP4, which inactivates it into inactive metabolites. The stable analogs of incretins are now developed with longer half-life. And if some of the FD-approved incretins are exanatide, liraglutide, and sexaglutide, and dolaglutide. So, what different kinds of incretins um, are now available. Incretins have been out in the market for almost uh, about 20 years now. One of the first uh, uh, incretins that came out was Bieta, which is a twice a day injection. Uh, and uh, Bieta or the Xanatide uh, was initially uh, discovered in the saliva of a lizard called Gila Monster. Um, and then the next one that to come out was uh, liraglutide or Victoza, which is taken as once daily injections. Uh, and then uh, you have um, eventually we had a longer acting or extended release um, uh, in cretins, which were um, there's an extended release version of exanatide called Bidurion, which is to be which can be taken once a week. And then there are two other um, incretin uh, hormones that can be taken once a week are uh, semaglutide and dolaglutide. And recently, FDA has uh, approved um, an oral GLP uh, just a few weeks back, uh, and that is uh, relatively new and uh, uh, still not uh, uh, used much in the market. So how does incretins work? In healthy patients, the ingestion of food results in the release of uh, gastrointestinal peptides, including GLP-1, which is the glucagon-like peptide 1, and GIP, which is the gastric inhibitory peptide, um, as well as the pancreatic beta cell hormones, insulin and amblin. The GLP-1 is released from the L cells that are located in the small intestine and the colon. Following the absorption of food, the GLP-1 promotes insulin secretion, otherwise known as the incretin effect. In diabetes, these steps are disturbed. So GLP-1 have at least four mechanisms by which they reduce blood glucose levels. Both GL GLP-1 and amblin, they have uh, inhibitory effects on gastric appetite and appetite. They improve glucose-dependent insulin secretion. Uh, they slow down the gastric emptying, they increase satiety, decrease postprandial glucose, and, and promotes beta cell proliferation. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of incretins? Since uh, incretins have a glucose-dependent secretion, they have a very, very low risk of hypoglycemia because if your glucose is not high, there is no incretin in the system. Similarly, they have, uh, they can, they have a, a powerful uh, 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 quality of uh, causing beta cell preservation, which is very unique to this class. Also, it has some cardiovascular benefits, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Uh, and then once weekly preparations are very convenient for the patient and widely used. Side effects uh, in terms are usually mainly involves GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Uh, mostly uh, you develop, one develops tolerance to nausea and it's gone in a couple of weeks. Um, risk of pancreatitis and renal dysfunction. And there's a black box warning for uh, 
for uh, medullary carcinoma of thyroid uh, based on animal studies. This uh, has not been observed in human studies. Um, and then contraindications include uh, history of pancreatitis and uh, personal or family history of medullary cancer uh, based on the black box warning. So the next important and uh, very exciting class of medication is the SGLT2 inhibitors. SGLT2 inhibitors or the glyphosones are a class of medications that inhibits reabsorb that work by inhibiting reabsorption of glucose in the kidney and and thereby lowering the blood glucose. This is an insulin independent function. So it, this function does not occur by increasing or re uh, insulin release or uh, by decreasing insulin resistance, this uh, effect occurs totally independent of insulin. Um, so because of the unique, unique mechanism of action, these medications can be combined uh, with any other medication. Um, so how does it work? They inhibit the sodium glucose transport protein 2 in the proximal tubule. Uh, and then uh, they have um, some cardiovascular benefit too, which again, we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, they also have some uh, weight loss benefits and uh, lowers blood, pre blood pressure. Um, several medications that are approved in this class includes canagliflozin, depagliflozin, and ampagliflozin. So in terms of benefits, uh, it's an oral pill, so it's very easy to use. It has a very unique mechanism of action. It does not work by insulin simulation, uh, and uh, it has uh, additional cardiovascular benefits, weight loss, and blood pressure lowering benefits. Uh, the risk of uh, hypoglycemia is there, um, however, um, and the renal function have to be monitored. They cannot be used in uh, patients with uh, moderate to um, severe renal impairment. And there's also uh, an increased risk for urinary tract infections and yeast infections with these medications. Um, another class of uh, medication uh, is, uh, is the amylin agonist, uh, pramlentite, uh, which works uh, through, uh, it's a recombinant DNA uh, that's produced uh, polypeptide analog of human amylin that is used in combination with insulin. Uh, and it is approved to be used in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, Pramlentide inhibits glucagon secretion, it decreases gastric emptying and promotes satiety and uh, uh, decreased, uh, it's helpful in reducing postprandial um, hyperglycemia. Some of the side effects are similar to those of incretins, um, like nausea, vomiting, headache, uh, abdominal pain, and fatigue. DPP-4 inhibitors are uh, basically um, DPP-4 is the enzyme which um, naturally inhibits incretins. Uh, and so uh, because of which the natural incretins uh, do not last long in your system to be able to lower your glucose. So DPP-4 inhibitors work by inhibiting the enzyme DPP-4. Uh, and once that uh, DPP-4 is inactivated, the natural incretins can then last longer and exert their uh, effect in lowering glucose. Um, um, DPP-4 inhibitors, however, um, uh, were studied in a meta-analysis in 2018 and did not find any extra favorable effect uh, on all-cause mortality or cardiovascular uh, system. So next big class of medication is, uh, is uh, the insulins. And again, um, normally, um, so uh, there are um, several different insulins um, that are available now. Um, and, uh, and, and so basically insulin is the hormone that's secreted in the beta cell of the pancreas. It's responsible for the metabolism and, and utilization of glucose in the body for maintaining blood glucose. Uh, normally, uh, insulin is secreted in a pulsatile manner. And the pulses occur under basal conditions in response to meal, under basal conditions and in response to meal. So before we move on to studying different kinds of insulin, we want to know how insulin functions normally in your body. So 
typically some insulin is released all the time in the body and this is in response to the gluconeogenesis by the liver then every time a person eats there is an increased pulse of insulin so if you have your breakfast lunch and dinner you have a pulse of insulin every time you eat so whenever you take insulin you want to follow the same mechanism and try to match uh, the normal physiological uh, secretion of insulin so the term intensive insulin therapy means it's a complex regime that includes basal insulin given as one to two daily injections of intermediate acting or long acting insulin along with a short acting insulin in type 2 diabetes intensive insulin regime is used for patients with severe insulin resistance requiring high doses of insulin so broadly you classify insulins into long acting insulins and short acting insulins so long acting insulins are more or less your basal insulins that last in your system for a long time most basal insulins available th these days will last for about 24 to 36 hours and these includes your uh, glargine detimer and diglodag insulins and then you have your nph or the intermediate acting insulin nph uh, was uh, was used for a long time before the basal insulin came but once the basal insulins uh, are out since they are uh, give you a more physiological response um, the use of nph is sort of decreasing uh, another big difference is that the nph um has a peak uh, it lasts in your system for about 12 hours and it has a peak and is associated with more hypoglycemia compared to the basal insulins and then you have the short acting insulins which are um you know, which includes the regular insulin and the insulin analogs again the insulin analogs are more uh, closer to natural insulins and they give you a more physiological lowering in blood glucose um and these are mainly taken before meals and they are have short half life they on, uh, last only for about 4 to 5 uh, hours in your in your system and so they have to be taken two or three times a day then is the premix insulin so the premix insulin is uh, uh, basically come in different proportions like 70 30 or 70 25 and they are a mixture of nph and one of the short acting insulins um the advantage of premix insulin is that it's it uh, it's a simpler regime because people don't have to uh, take diff two different kinds of insulins however uh, it sort of restricts um, uh, the dosing because if you increase one kind of insulin you end up increasing the other kind and so it is associated uh, with a little bit more hypoglycemia then the last uh, one of the other classes of insulin is the concentrated insulins concentrated insulins are uh, basically used in patients who uh, require very high doses of insulin usually over 200 units and they come in uh, concentrations of u500 insulin u200 and u300 insulins um and then uh, finally you have another class of insulin the inhaled insulin which came out a um, few years back um there was a lot of excitement when it came out initially however this requires a lot of uh, uh, uh pulmonary function monitoring even before starting the treatment and then uh, while the person patient is on the treatment and has uh, not been very popular so in type 2 diabetes insulin is provided in three different ways you can provide insulin give insulin as a basal supplement with an intermediate acting or a long acting preparation to suppress the hepatic glucose production and this can be combined with uh, oral or other injectable medications and then um, you can give as a pre meal bolus dose of short acting insulin to cover the extra requirement after the food is absorbed and then as a multiple dose insulin regime uh, including a combination of basal and bolus insulin and it can be given as a premix combination of intermediate or short acting insulin which we just talked about the 70 30 or the 70 25 combination um in addition it can also be given in combination with the glp for example uh, suliqua or zoltrophy are two medications uh, which are combinations of basal insulin and glp
So when should you uh, give insulin? Insulin treatment is uh, uh, usually, or when should you rather use insulin as an initial treatment for diabetes, even before you use anything else? So there are certain circumstances where insulin should be used first. And this is when it's difficult to distinguish between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, as we know, can only be treated with insulin. So if you're not sure at the time of diagnosis if the patient has type 1 or type 2, then you have to treat these patients with type 1 diabetes type uh, with insulin until you're sure uh, um, of the diagnosis. Second, patients who are presenting with symptomatic severe hyperglycemia with or without ketonuria, such as patients who are in diabetic ketoacidosis, must be treated with insulin. These patients are usually managed on insulin drip. And then patients presenting with severe hyperglycemia with a fasting glucose of over 250 or a random glucose of over 300 or an A1C over 9, it's recommended um, that they should be started on insulin uh, as a first-line treatment since uh, this is a state of uh, glucose toxicity. And the only thing uh, that will work fast in a state of glucose toxicity is insulin. And uh, insulin in type 2 diabetes patients, for the most part, otherwise, it's usually added uh, onto patients' regime when oral medications alone or other injectables such as GLP um, is, not, is insufficient to lower the blood glucose. So how, how do you dose insulin? The initial dose for basal insulin is, uh, is 0.2 units per kg in type 2 diabetics. Uh, for D-glutac, uh, it is recommended to start at 10 units and then titrate up. Uh, if, you're, if the fasting glucose is very high to begin with, uh, over 200 or 300, then uh, the insulin can be started at a higher dose. And the dose can be titrated by one to two units every three to four days until glycemic control is achieved. The optimal dose depends on many factors, including the current and target blood glucose levels, carbohydrate content of the meal, and activity of the patient. Typical starting dose for a short-acting insulin is about four to six units uh, before meals. You kind of start with that, but the actual way for taking short-acting insulin is based on the carbohydrate intake, uh, as well as on the blood glucose level. And we call it, uh, when patient does carb counting, we do carb and correction regime. So there are many factors that you have to consider. Um, now that we have, before starting somebody on medications for diabetes, now that we have discussed all the di uh, diabetes medications, we know that there are many choices. So how do we decide which medications to use? One option is to follow guidelines. However, each patient is different and has uh, his own unique needs. So there are certain factors that we can look into when starting uh, your um, antihypoglycemic medications. Depending on how bad the glucose is, if the glucose is high, you want a stronger medication, uh, um, such as, uh, you know, uh, if you use um, uh, like a GLP or a metformin, uh, if you uh, only need, if the, if the hemoglobin A1C is not very high, and if you're just looking for mild improvement, then you can use a, something like a DPP-4 inhibitor. Also, if the patient is obese, uh, then you may want to use one of those medications that helps with weight loss, such as GLP or SGLT. Uh, and uh, if the patient uh, has um, already has diarrhea or um, some GI problem like IBS, then metformin may not be a good choice. Um, similarly, cost is a main factor. So no matter what you would do if or what kind of medications you may prescribe, if the patient cannot afford it, they're not going to use it and it will not work. So it's really important to discuss with the patients when you're prescribing medications, if they can actually afford that medication. So there are uh, several class of medications that have uh, recently come up that has additional cardiovascular benefits in addition to glucose lowering benefits. And in 2008, US FDA introduced guidelines for studying new diabetes medications to track long-term cardiovascular outcomes and safety. And large clinical trials have demonstrated that several diabetes drugs have long-term cardiovascular benefits. 
In UK PDA study, metformin therapy, when compared with conventional medical therapy, significantly reduced the uh, reduced um, the rate of MI by 39% and all-cause mortality by 36%. Um, the GLP-1 class have been associated with additional cardiovascular benefit, including weight loss, lower systolic blood pressure, triglyceride levels, and C-reactive protein levels. The leader trial um, was a large trial that compared liraglutide versus placebo in patients with diabetes who are at high risk for cardiovascular event, and it showed 13% lower rate of major cardiovascular event after 3.8 years. Similarly, SGLT2 inhibitors, um, especially empagliflozin, has shown also shown cardiovascular benefit. The EMPAREC outcome uh, showed that the treatment with empagliflozin for a median of 2.6 years showed a relative risk reduction of 38% in death from cardiovascular causes among patients with type 2 diabetes at increased risk for uh, increased cardiovascular risk. So. That concludes our uh, medications for diabetes. In addition to medications, uh, some of the other th important things in management of diabetes is self-monitoring of blood glucose. That's one of the crucial things. If patients uh, would monitor their glucose, that way they can keep track of how the diabetes is being managed, as well as uh, the physician, uh, it's helpful for the physician to, uh, to see how they're responding to medications. Um, Typically, it is recommended that patients monitor glucose at least before each meal, uh, three times a day. Uh, and then besides uh, glucose monitoring, there are some routine labs that are uh, recommended to be done uh, for diabetics. Uh, and these includes um, uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is a test that uh, gives an average of glucose in three months, should be done every three months. Renal function should be monitored at least one to two times a day depending on what medications they're using. Um, lipids should be checked at least annually to uh, assess their cardiovascular uh, risk. Uh, urine microalbumin is done annually. And all diabetic patients between age 45 and 79 are now recommended to be on uh, statin medications um, as uh, due to the additional benefit uh, that statins have uh, in decreasing cardiovascular risk in diabetic patients. Um, and in addition to this, annual eye exam and annual foot exam is recommended uh, for all diabetics. To summarize, all patients with type 2 diabetes should be treated initially with lifestyle modification with diet and physical activity with or without metformin therapy. Each patient with type 2 diabetes needs a customized uh, approach uh, and a treatment regime depending on their age, weight, lifestyle, psychological needs, and socioeconomic status. Patients should be made aware that initiating insulin does not represent a personal failure and that many patients with type 2 diabetes will, in, will eventually require insulin due to decrease in their endogenous insulin production. It is also important to make sure that each patient who has started on insulin gets proper training and education on the use of insulin to avoid unwanted side effects, especially hypoglycemia. And then complications associated with diabetes, as we know, are debilitating and are associated with increased mortality and morbidity. It is crucial to do appropriate and timely screening for these complications. It is also very important for every diabetic patient to receive proper diabetes education, including training for glucose monitoring, nutritional counseling, understanding medications, and to learn appropriate measures to prevent complications. So this concludes our uh, talk on management of diabetes. Thank you.